Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Um, welcome to lesson four. Yeah? Um, where in this lesson, um, we're going to cover uh, the concept and also on how to account and report uh, assets and its related uh, items. Yeah? Okay, as one of the stakeholders in a company, um, either you are an investor or even you are the managers of a company, you, are, you have to know or you want to know what is the position that the company is in at the moment. Uh, how strong the company is. If, for example, that you want to invest in this particular company, definitely that you want to know how strong the company is. Um, normally, the strength of a company is based on its assets. Uh, how much asset that this company basically has. So, when we want to analyze the asset that this company has, for example, um, we have to know what are the characteristics of an asset and also what are the different categories of asset. In general, um, asset is basically, it can be a monetary or also non-monetary. Um, it, it can also be in the form of tangible, yeah, something that you can touch, something that you can hold. Or it can be in intangible uh, object. Um, but that company must have a legal claim, legal ownership on that particular asset. Why asset are very important to a company? Because any company would need asset to support its operation. It supports to daily operation um, of the entire uh, business. And in addition to that, company also need to have asset so that it can, I mean, this asset can be used for future um, uh, benefit. What do I mean by future benefit is basically um, you, the company may use or may sell this asset or dispose their asset, perhaps maybe if they want to pay up, yeah? maybe they want to pay back their liabilities or loan. That's why we call it asset also will also decrease the liabilities. So when, when, when a company use the asset to pay the liability, so I mean directly the effect will be the, the liability will be, will be reduced. We have basically two uh, clear definitions or two clear categories of asset. One is what we call long-term asset, and the other is what we call current asset. So, what, how shall we define current asset? Yeah. The key words that we have to use to identify an asset, either it's a current or non-current, is the level of liquidity that asset has, whether or not that asset is convertible. Yeah? It can be easily, easily convertible into cash within, within a year. An example of current asset, yeah? um, of course, the, the direct example is the cash, yeah? shares, or we call it marketable security, short-term loan, I mean, short-term investment, yeah, account, ac account receivable, and some prepaid and also inventory. So basically, current asset is so important to a particular company because 
you can know the ability of this particular company to support its daily operation. Okay? If, if they have a good amount or sufficient amount of current asset, because they need this asset to support its it daily operation as well. Not like the non-current asset, where non-current asset may be in the form of uh, machine, vehicle, that, um, that the company use for its daily operation, okay, to generate revenue. But this current asset is more on basically to pay something or to fulfill any short-term obligation. Um, if the company has to pay its utility, for example, so the company will need cash. And that cash will be coming from the asset which is categorized into the current asset. And also, um, we also have asset that which, which are in this, in, this, in this category that can be convertible. Convertible means that the company can sell this asset to the outsiders and they will get money out of that. Yeah? So one way to know yeah, whether that asset is a current asset or not, so you may test its level of liquidity. Yeah? How easy that asset is basically uh, converted into cash. Yeah? Okay, one example of current asset is receivable. Um, receivable uh, are basically arise from the um, credit uh, sales. Yeah, when a company sells their good on credit, so the company has to record all that transaction into, into this account, what we call this receivable. As you know that a company may, may, may sell by cash or by credit. Yeah? So if the company sell their good on credit, so that means the company has to record this transaction using the receivable accounts. So basically account receivable, just to show that there is a potential that company will receive some amount of money in the future. Um, yeah, this is an asset in the form of current asset. We have two different types of receivable. Um, the American terms account receivable, but in Malaysia, for example, we used to call it a trade receivable. Yeah, trade receivable. Uh, we also have another form of receivable where the Americans would like to call it notes receivable, but Malaysia, in Malaysia, we still call it trade receivable, but we mention that as a non current trade receivable. So what differentiate between these, these two categories of receivable? So basically, account receivable is um, amount that the company expect to collect within 12 months. Yeah. Um, so that means if you are, if, if, if a company sell their product today, so this company is expecting to be paid Within, through, within, within 12 months from today. Yeah, from today. How about notes receivable then? Note receivable, or in Malaysia we call it long term trade receivable, is basically a company sells on credit, but they would expect the buyer yeah, or the adapters to pay back more than 12 months. Yeah. They will take a bit longer uh, to repay, uh, I mean, to, to, pay, to pay their receivable. Um, in, 
in normal circumstances, company would charge a certain amount of interest, and the basically there is a more there is formal there is a formal contract, formal agreement between between the two parties. Yeah, if in account receivable, maybe invoices will do, but in note receivable, perhaps maybe you need. A some form of more formal contract, yeah. So this is basically the difference between account receivables and note receivable. Just between, I mean, I mean, just uh, the amount account receivable, something that you uh, you would expect to 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 get paid or receive payment within twelve months, and note receivable you may expect a longer than that, yeah. Most company can only survive if they sell their good on credit. Yeah. In fact, I mean, unless um, you are dealing with a very small, I mean, uh, uh, or small, uh, small company, or uh, you are dealing with a company that that in a form of retail, for example. Um, so maybe. Most of the transaction are basically in the form of cash, but if you are um, dealing with more expensive item, a very specialized item, for example, you would expect the transaction will be more on credit term or credit basis. So, if you are, or if your company have substantial amount of account receivables you must be able to anticipate the risk of not being paid the risk of not be not paying back yeah we call it credit risk yeah you have to you have to foresee that. Yeah? You have to undertake into consideration the risk of not pay, not receiving your payment. Yeah. Normally, company which have which involve a substantial amount of um, of um, basically credit sales, normally they have a special we call it credit departments or credit unit. To manage, yeah, to manage this account receivable and also note receivable. Um, some just a fundamental uh, principles when we we'll deal when you know when we we'll deal with this receivable is that as much as possible try to distinguish, yeah, try to separate the duties uh, between the cash basis and also the credit basis. So don't put, yeah. You may advise your company, don't put or, or don't um, allow the single person or the same person to manage the cash and also the credit sale. So these are some of the um, uh, some of the measures that you may take to control the account receivable. Yeah. Okay. Again, when when a company making substantial amount of credit sales, of course, the, the company would also have a substantial amount of account receivable. So, even though there is a benefit out of it, yeah, because, I mean, um, as, as human being, as much as possible, they try to defer their payment. So in that sense, you would get more sales if you sell on credit. But there is, the, there is something against that. There is, the, I mean, there is another, you know, there another issue that you are dealing with. You are exposed to what we call the, the credit risk. So the cost is basically some customer may not be able to pay yeah, the amount that they, that they purchase. So again, go back to the principles of disclosure. 
um, a company they have to disclose what is really happening in a company they also have to disclose the the right picture okay the right picture of of a certain amount okay of of a, of a certain amount um, in other words companies are expected to disclose their information using these principles yeah fair value accounting or sometimes we call it mark to mark i mean mark to market accounting so why this all about these principles is basically require company to disclose all the information in the financial statements on the amount which is close to market value yeah close to market value even though it's highly recommended to be exact as what the market value is but at least you have to show that you are trying to give or to disclose the amount which is really close to market to market value so that means if you have account receivable of 1 million for example okay if you have account receivable of 1 million you have to tell the user okay whether or not this 1 million really worth to the market value or to the fair value in other words you have to inform correctly okay whether or not the amount is actually the amount that you would expect to get okay from your customer yeah. from your customer so if you have 1 million in the account receivable okay you have to tell the world okay you have to tell the stakeholders that this amount of 1 million is something that you can collect okay that is the indicator understood by the stakeholders All right but if based on your experience based on the past performance you believe that out of that 1 million 10% will be default 10% of this 1 million is i mean uh, highly likely that the debtors are not, are not able to pay you have to disclose that in the financial statement okay you have to tell you have to tell for example that out of this 1 million i would anticipate that 10% is basically we call it impaired okay 10% of that amount is impaired all right so that's why one i mean Another principle that we have to use over here is that you have to give some allowance. You have to give certain amount, we call it as allowance, okay, from the total amount of account receivable that you have. The allowance of what? The allowance of not getting back. Yeah, the allowance of not of, of debtors may default or they might not be able to pay their debts yeah this also align with the matching principles okay the expenses that incur in the process of generate generating revenue yeah so um so so again and you have to treat that you, know, you have to treat the potential amount that you anticipate will not be able to receive in a form of expense you have to expand that in the in the com in the comprehensive in finance income statement yeah so that's why 
Okay. Before we look into how ink account receivable is recorded, okay, in the ink in the uh, financial statement, maybe we can look into this. These are two popular method, or basically, yeah, popular method used by company to determine the quantum of allowance should be given to the to the account receivable. Yeah, because again, as an accountant, you cannot just give numbers just like that. Okay, you have to give some justification. What on what are the basis that you use to come up with that figure? Okay, if you say that, yeah, if you say that, ten percent of the out of the account receivable is impaired or highly potential that you will not get back the money. So you have to show what is the basis that you use to determine the ten percent. Yeah. So one of the method is what we call the percent of sales. Yeah. This is what we call the income statement approach. That you know, perhaps maybe we can use the basis. For example, out of um, how much? Out of two million sales, for example, or out of um, you know one 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 point five million sales. Yeah, uh, maybe ten percent of that sale is uncollectible. So you may use that as an amount to put as a as an allowance. Another method which is even more popular is we call it aging of accounts. This method is even more systematic because you arrange or you systematically um, arrange the account receivable into its age. Normally, yeah, normally um, the the risk of 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 not being paid, yeah, the risk of default is higher if the account receivable is age or you know something that you have given it a long time ago, as compared to the most recent one. So perhaps maybe you can use using the probability here. For example, that the chance, the yeah, the 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 chance of account receivable which age nine months, for example, uh, may have a thirty percent of risk being default. For the account receivable which age one month, for example, maybe about zero point one percent of of being the of uh, of being default. So you may use that as a basis for you to determine the allowance. So when you have determined the allowance, this is how you should record in the in the financial in the statement of financial position. Yeah, this is how you should record. All right. So for example, that. If the total of the account receivable is one million, for example, so you have to put some allowance of uncollectible, yeah, ten percent, okay, ten ten percent of that, you know, and also, and then you put the, then you put the net net amount net amount here, yeah, or in most cases you will get you will just mention the net here. And the detail, maybe you can put in the form of, in in the form of notes to the notes to the account. Yeah, yeah. I would bring you. I will walk you through to the example that you that you may see in any of the annual report. Okay, right. So we go to the account to the uh, annual report of this UMW. So, okay. 
okay if we go back to to the early statement that i made asset is so important to a company because what it shows the strength of a company so over here when we are talking about the strength of the company how much uh, what is the degree of strength that this company has if we take the total asset here it shows how much there 10.5 million or billion billion yeah because it's in thousand so so umw for example is what we call this 10 billions company because normally we we what we call um, we relate yeah we relate the strength of the company by looking at the total asset yeah okay if you look at to any any um, any any statement of financial position of a company you will see that yeah most company would begin with the non current asset okay non current asset and also they normally company would systematically categorize into the asset into non-current asset and also current asset. So for current asset, we have inventory, something that we have discussed last week. And we also have this receivable, yeah? Receivables. We also have this other investment, yeah? Maybe the company may invest in, any for, in, uh, in, a, in other company or in other entity. The company may also have derivative asset, for example, normally derivative is used to manage risk, for example, yeah, um, uh, to to manage uh, forest exchange risk, and also for uh, um, yeah. So these are the instrument that normally the company use to manage uh, financial risk, and also deposit and cash, and yeah, and the, the bottom there as some non-current asset held for sales. So if you see over here, yeah, basically it fall it really align all these align with our definition of current asset yeah they are um, um, they they can be convertible okay into into cash okay within 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 a year right and so on right okay you also see here yeah we also have receivable here and also receivable here so that's why I, that's why I, I I, I always remind you that you know, don't judge the, uh, the item by its name. Yeah? So you have to really check, you have to really diagnose what are, what, what are the characteristics that this item has. Yeah? So this one, yeah, receivable, yeah, still sales on credit, but maybe it's involved a longer, a longer term. Yeah? Uh, so that means the buyer may have more than one year to pay back their amount. Yeah? Okay, but over here, the, the buyer or the debtors will pay this company back within, within 12 months. Yeah? Within 12 months. And same goes to the others. So all this is something that the company would expect to sell. Okay? Either they want, they will sell, okay, or they or um, or they will, yeah, uh, this one for example, inventory, they will sell this inventory within 12 months. They will get this amount receivable. They will get this amount back within 12 months. Other investment, yeah, they will, maybe they will sell this, yeah, maybe they will sell this investment within, uh, within, within one year. And derivative asset also, yeah, uh, 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 they're going to sell this asset uh, within 12, uh, 12 months or one year. Of course, cash is basically cash. And also non-current asset held for sales. Yeah? So this basically, 
even though you have non current asset you know for example property plant and equipment but if you plan for example you have a plan you have plan to display to dispose or sell this asset within one year so you have to categorize you have to categorize those asset into this category yeah so all right so maybe we can go in in more detail we go to the um, yeah receivable note 16 and we're going to see on how this particular company disclose its receivable Yeah. So we have current, we have current, we have trade receivable and other receivable. Yeah. So basically, these are amount that that the company would expect to get within twelve months, and this is more than twelve months, right? So you know, again, they they use the same terms. Yeah, they use the same terms. Either trade receivable or or this one, yeah, Tra but they only categorize them into a different category, yeah, one current and non-current, yeah. And you also you you also see yeah, all the accrued, for example, well the prepayment that that we discussed before, we put into the the current the current asset. Okay. So for trade receivable. Again, to ensure that we are, we are telling the truth. Yeah, we are telling the true picture what is happening to the company. So we have to really make sure that the amount that we show or that we disclose in the uh, financial statements are really true. You know, so so yeah, you have to determine whether is there any impairment. Okay? Is there any impairment? On the on our account receivable in 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 payment means that the the possibility of being default yeah so um, it in the notes you will also see for example how this amount is obtained yeah so so this basically come this company is using the age method yeah using the age method. So this company would say that it put a different category there, right? So it it disclosed, for example, these are the amount, okay? These are the amount that fall into this category, okay? A payable during one until thirty days. This is the amount, okay? Right? And yeah, you have to tell you have to tell everything here, right? To to the, the most recent and also the the oldest one, okay? And you have to mention how much of this is is basically impact, yeah, basically impact. And this is the the total of trade receivable that that really show the 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 the, um, the actual uh, the actual figure, yeah. And then, then you show, for example, all these, you know, um, all the allowance and so on here. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you are basically telling, uh, you know, telling the world or telling the user the right amount of this account receivable. Okay. Um, now we go to the another category of asset. Yeah? We call it non-current asset. Yeah, non-current asset. In non-current asset, we have two categories. We have two different type of long terms or non-current asset. Uh, one category is a tangible asset. Okay, tangible asset. And so, um, yeah. And okay, to to fall into this category. The assets must be, of course, a tangible, something that you can hold, something that you can touch and see, right? And you, uh, you must use this in the operation. 
you, I mean, that company would expect to benefit, okay, in the future period. So if it, if that asset fulfill this category, this will fall into the property plan and equipment. Yeah. So sometimes they call it PPE. Yeah. Okay. So for this nature of asset, normally it the value decline, yeah, the value decline over its useful life. Okay, what is useful life? Is expected period that this asset can be used. Yeah. Um, so the maximum period that this asset can be used. Yeah. And all right. So when we dealing with this asset, yeah. We have to know how to account them. For example, how shall we record uh, this when, when, we, when we purchase the asset? Yeah? So at that stage, we have to be able to determine the cost of that asset. Yeah? The cost of that asset. And after we can record the right figure, the right amount of that asset, then we have to expand, we have to allocate a certain expenditure over a period of usage. Yeah? And if we use the asset, if the company use the asset until at the end of the period, so that means um, the account will automatically be closed at the end of the period. But there are circumstances that company may, be, may dispose, may sell the asset. So in that, may, I mean, if we are in that situation, we also have to deal with, uh, 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 we're going to deal how should be recorded. Yeah. Okay. How shall we determine the cost of an asset? The cost of an asset basically constitute not only the purchase price, yeah, not only the purchase price, but also all expenditure incurred. Yeah? All expenditure incurred which, which are needed, which are needed to ensure that the asset are available are ready to be used yeah for example that um, you buy one machine for example yeah you buy one machine and this machine is so special and unique it must be stored yeah it must be home in a very special in a special room in a, in, a, in, a, in a special room, perhaps maybe with the right temperature and so on. So that means if this asset is not placed into this nature of room, so that means you cannot use this asset. In this example, so the cost of that asset, not only the cost that, that you pay to purchase the asset, but also the cost used to build or to prepare the room okay, for this particular asset. Yeah? Um, if we go to the next example of land, it's even more complicated. Okay? Again, you on, you, um, the cost does not only constitute the purchase price, but also the other expenditure that incur in the process that you own the asset yeah or you 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 own the land okay perhaps maybe you have to pay some taxes you have to pay the legal the legal team there are many other commission involved for example also all those all those expenditure expenses must be incurred must be included in the in the cost of that land yeah uh, something unique about land is that you don't, yeah? We don't depreciate land, yeah? We don't depreciate land. Okay, how about if 
if we purchase a land okay and um, we improve we develop the land um, so that the land can be in a usable state so you know maybe we we build roads there you know a, a maybe gate of fence or lighting system for example all right this amount also can be a consider an asset yeah or the amount that you pay okay the amount that you pay to build this these are also consider an asset and you may depreciate them yeah same goes to the building huh? same goes to the building all the costs that incur okay not all, not only the building but the title fee the lawyer the lawyer fees and brokerage fees and also some other taxes or duties that you have to pay okay um so these are the example of long term asset but please bear in mind regarding the building not all building can can be constituted into the long term asset okay you can categorize building as a non as a long term asset if that building is on the freehold um agreement freehold agreement yeah but if if you purchase a land i mean if if you purchase a building and the building is situated on the on the lease hold on the lease hold basis you know lease hold basis so it will not fall into this non current asset it will fall into the intangible asset yeah basically you don't you don't own the land and also the building okay you don't you don't own them yeah you just what you just have the right to use you know to stay in that property yeah so the right to use is basically your the intangible asset okay so you have to be able to differentiate this category of as the of asset yeah machine and equipment all right so so it will you need you need to cover all yeah you need uh, to cover all the expenditure that incur in the process of getting of getting the machine and the equipment okay so if you look back into our principles of matching okay um we have to incur expenditure okay if during the process of generating income or revenue they are some element of expenditure incur or occur yeah okay non current asset is basically that we use in our daily operation to generate income okay to generate income so we have to capture the cost that um the cost that we use um from the from the asset yeah from the asset from the machine for example um because while the while the asset are being used the value depreciate yeah the value depreciate so this depreciation is an is an example of expenditure and you and you have to incur this expenditure yeah you have to incur this expenditure but we have to incur the expenditure in a very systematic way in a very systematic way so yeah so that's why that's why we have to compute you have we, that's why you have to systematically compute and get the right amount of depreciation 
yeah so what are the factors you know what are the variable that involve in the process of calculating the depreciation so to help us to determine the amount of depreciation that you going to expand in that particular period we need to have a minimum of this three yeah three factors the cost yeah the cost of the asset the salvage value yeah the salvage value is basically the value that you would anticipate that you will get at the end of its useful period yeah let's say that you anticipate this asset is useful for 10 years for example and after the after 10 years if you sell this asset how much can you expect uh, from from that disposal or from that sales so that is basically the salvage value yeah um, we have many methods actually uh, we have many method to determine the depreciation amount the three most popular one is a uh, straight line yeah unit of production and declining balance so so for straight line method okay it's very straightforward okay um, of course refer back to my slide before right so we need all the three factors right we need all the three factors and do we have those do we have the all the three factors yeah we do have we have the cost we have the salvage value and we also need to have useful life and so that means for any transaction all this information must be there okay you need all this information to help you to determine the amount of depreciation for that particular period so over here you have you know if if you read carefully okay you know this is the cost right this is the cost 50k this is the useful life five years and this is the salvage value yeah so you know sometimes they call it residual value yeah but so that's why i think i would suggest you not to remember that not to remember the a certain concept by its you know by its names but more on its definition and concept so residual value i mean some company may use residual value some textbook may use a residual value okay but it gives the same meanings to the salvage value yeah so in this example so we know the cost we know the residual value or the salvage value and we divided by the useful life and we got the depreciation for for that year yeah for that period <laughs> and this is how you're going to record them this amount we go to the statements of comprehensive income and this amount will appear in the statement of financial position yeah okay okay after and after five years so this is how it look like it start with a book value again okay, some um, some books or some company may use a book value yeah um, some some I mean some company may use even a a carrying amount yeah? carrying amount but it, it it actually means the same uh, terms yeah mean the same and then we depreciate every year so each year the de the depreciation amount is 9000 okay and this is another account we call it accumulated depreciation is basically a contra account to the asset because 
we're going to show the book value. If you see over here, the book value declining, yeah, or reduce over years, yeah, over years. How we get the book value? The book value is basically fifty thousand, yeah. The book value is fifty thousand. The original cost minus accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation, yeah. And then you got forty one. And then forty one, yeah. Forty one. You minus nine or fifty thousand. Minus eighteen, then you got thirty-two. Yeah. Next year again, fifty thousand minus twenty-seven, you got twenty-three. Until at the end of the useful life, you will see the book value will have a balance of five thousand, and that is equate. Yeah, that is the amount of salvage. Salvage value, yeah. Um, for straight line method, you know, sometimes maybe, um, maybe we can divide by years, or we we also can divide by percentage, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to be years, yeah. Sometimes they give you, for example, uh, depreciation rate is ten percent, for example, using a straight line, yeah. Depreciation ten percent using a straight line. So in that example, what is the useful line? Depreciation rate ten percent using a straight line method. So what is the useful life? Ten years. Ten years. Good. Yeah. So so this is how it look like. Okay. From uh, uh, from the um, from the graphic. Um, yeah. This is the depreciation amount, and that is on the bottom right. There is the book value. Yeah, book value. Um, another method is called the unit of production method. This is um, maybe more suitable for a machine. Or maybe for the vehicle, for example, where we depreciate or we expand the depreciation depreciation amount based on the usage, based on the usage, yeah. And okay, in order for us to use that formula, there are basically two steps that you have to follow. Firstly, that you have to determine the depreciation per unit, yeah, depreciation per unit. Because you need that, yeah, you need the depreciation per unit, and then you have to multiply by the number of unit produced in the period to get the depreciation expense. Yeah. So the depreciation unit is basically cost minus salvage value. Yeah. And divided by total unit of production. For example, that yeah, over here you must be a very good uh, estimator. Yeah, estimator.